Hello to everyone. Welcome to the course on numerical linear algebra and application. Today we are going to have twenty second lecture. Before going to the this lecture, let us quickly recall what we did in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we have learned how actually the Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting and Gaussian elimination with complete pivoting would give you best approximation as compared to the without pivoting for different examples. Today we are going to see some of the properties associated with matrix systems. A symmetric positive different systems would arise quite often when you are dealing with physical examples such as heat conduction equation, Poisson equation and so on and so forth with associated initial and boundary conditions. The associated initial and boundary conditions could be flux boundary conditions, oscillatory boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions and so on and so forth. So when you are handling these models, you do end up with a special kind of systems and the associated matrix will be a special property. So we would formally define what is the positive different matrix, how it could influence the solution of the system while doing the approximation for realistic cases. A symmetric matrix A is positive definite if for every non-zero vector x, x transpose Ax is greater than 0. x transpose Ax is greater than 0, where x is set of vectors x1, x2, x of n transpose. Then you have x transpose a of x will be equivalent to summation i comma j will be equivalent to 1 to n a i j x i x of j. This is what is called the quadratic form associated with the matrix A. This is called the quadratic form associated with matrix A. A positive semi definite matrix is similarly we can define a symmetric matrix A is semi definite if x transpose ax is greater than or equal to 0 for all vectors x. x transpose ax is greater than or equal to 0 for all vectors x. Now we would see some of the characteristics and properties of positive definite matrices. A symmetric matrix A is positive definite if and only if all its eigenvalues are positive. A symmetric matrix A is positive definite if all its leading principal minors are positive. In fact, the statement is 
implies and implied by if a is equal to a j is symmetric positive definite then a i j that is i throw and j th column is symmetric positive definite. So essentially a is equal to a i j is symmetric positive definite. Then the largest element in magnitude, then the largest element in magnitude of the whole matrix must lie on the diagonal. Whole matrix must lie on the diagonal. The sum of two symmetric positive definite matrices is symmetric positive definite. This is one of the very important property of symmetric positive definite matrices. Let us see the remark. Note that the properties exhibited in third and fourth gives only necessary conditions for a symmetric matrix to be positive definite. So what are the third and fourth conditions? Look at over here, what we wrote over here. If A i j is semi positive definite, then, all, then A i j for all i. And if A i j is symmetric positive definite, then the largest element in magnitude of the whole matrix must lie on the diagonal. So these two properties are actually necessary. They can serve only as initial tests for positive definiteness. I mean, they are all actually not sufficient. They can only serve as a initial test. That means initial test. For example, if you look at the matrices, A is equal to 4 rows, 4 columns, 4 rows and 4 columns, 4, 1, 1, 1 and it is 1, 1, 1, 1. Look at this, this is 4 and this is 0, this is 2 and this is 4. And say matrix B is 20, 15, 5 on the main diagonal. Cannot be positive definite. Look at this. Since matrix A, there is a zero entry on the diagonal. There is a zero. So this is violating the condition. Violating. And in the matrix B, the largest entry 25 is not on the diagonal. So actually, you know, this is the largest element. This is the largest element. So, in fact, by interchanging the R1 to R3, this could be achieved. But as such, 20 is not actually bigger element. So therefore it is not positive definite. So these two examples illustrate us what are the, uh, the properties of the positive definite matrices. Now let us correlate with a specialized systems Heisenberg system. Again consider the system AX is equal to B. So A is the coefficient matrix. B is right side vector and X is unknown. Where A is an upper 
एजरबर्ग मैट्रिक्स ऑफ ऑर्डर एन सोल्यूशन ऑफ ए हेजनबर्ग सिस्टम एराइजेस इन सेवरल प्रैक्टिकल एप्लीकेशन इंक्लूडिंग दि आइगन वेक्टर कॉम्पिटिशन ऑफ ए मैट्रिक्स सॉलविंग ए हेजनबर्ग सिस्टम रिक्वायर्स मच लेस कॉम्पिटिशन एफेक्ट दैन सॉलविंग ए एन आर्बिटरी सिस्टम so that is the reason that we are handling the a specialized heisenberg system this is because at each step of elimination process only one entry needs to be updated due to the special structure of heisenberg matrix so since only one entry you are updating that means the number of floating points flops per second would reduce so thereby the algorithm is better the algorithm is better so when you have a specialized system such as the heisenberg system it will help us in order to reduce the flop count then we would see what is the growth factor and stability of gaussian elimination for a heisenberg system the growth factor for a heisenberg matrix using gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is bounded by n thus a heisenberg system can be safely solved using partial pivoting the growth factor for a heisenberg matrix using gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is bounded by n thus a heisenberg system can be safely solved using partial pivoting and the flop count is it requires only 3n square flops it requires only 3n square flops to solve a heisenberg system significantly less than 2n cube by flops required to solve n by n system with an arbitrary matrix so for let's say for n is equal to 3 so 3 into 3 square that is 27 and it is 2 into n cube that is 3 cube divided by 3 so that is 2 into 9 18 so this is less for a system of n by 3 by 3 matrix so it requires 27 it requires 18 only well we can compute the flop count triangulation n square flops triangulation n square flops where n is size of the matrix solution of the lower triangular system n square flops where n is the size of the matrix solution of the upper triangular system that is n square flops so you require n square you require n square you require n square so that will be equal to 3 n square suppose n is equal to 3 so 3 into 3 square that is 
So, 3 n square flops that is floating point per second. Well, so it requires 3 n square floating points per second. Thus, the conclusion can be made as the Heisenberg system can be solved with only 3 n square flops in a stable way using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. So, in fact, so this accuracy would help us in order to get the best approximation. Okay? Well, whatever we spoke till now, let us demonstrate through this example. Solve the Heisenberg system Ax is equal to b with a is equal to 3 by 3 matrix 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, 0, 5, 6 and b is equal to 6, 9, 11 transpose. Using partial pivoting, compute the growth factor. So, growth factor will decide the stability of the system. The pivot on the first column is identified as the 2, 1 entry. Interchange row 2 with row 1 and overwrite it with A. So, essentially what was the matrix is? This is the matrix and obviously 1 is smaller than 2. So, bring this 2 as first row, first element. First row first element. So, if you bring as a first row first element, then it will be like this. Now, multiply the first row by minus 1 by 2 and add it to the second row. So, the ultimate matrix will become like this. You see here, 5 is actually bigger than 1 by 2. So, therefore, multiply m1 to minus 1 by 2, permutation row index r1 is 2. So, second row. With that, the first pivot on the second column is identified as 3 to entry of the current matrix. So, interchange this second and third row. So, essentially you end up with this 2 and this is the bigger one. You make now this as 0. Multiply this second row by minus 1 over 10 and add it to the third row to obtain the matrix. Look at this matrix. This is the main diagonal. These are all zeros and this is the non-zero values. Permutation row index R2 is 3. So, essentially you will have upper triangular matrix. This is the upper triangular matrix and using the multipliers, you construct a lower triangular matrix. These are all zeros and you get the permutation matrix in this fashion. Initially, you started with 100, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So, when you apply this row interchanges, you end up with this matrix. This is the permutation matrix. So, computation of the growth factor is rho is equal to maximum of 6, 6, 6. So, it is 6 upon 6, which is 1. Now, solution of the system L of y is equal to b prime which is equal to p of b. So, which implies y will be equivalent to 9, 11, 2 by 5 transpose. Then you do solve u of x is equal to y which implies x is equal to 1, 1, 1 transpose. Look at this. How the true solution? Let us verify. 1 into 1, 
2 into 1, 3 into 1. So 3 to the 5, 1, 6. It's okay. 2 into 1, 2. 3 into 1, 3. 3 to 5. 4 into 1, 4. 7 plus 2, 9. 0 into 1, 5 into 1, 6 into 1, 6 plus 3, 11. Okay, it is exact solution. Now let's see diagonally dominant systems. How actually this diagonally dominant system would help us in order to find out the solutions. A matrix A is equal to A i j. So matrix A is equal to A of i j is column diagonally dominant is column diagonally dominant if A 1 1 greater than or equal to A 2 1 A 3 1 A 4 1 a n 1, A 2 2 greater than or equal to A 1 2, A 3 2, A 2 n. Like this you have A n n greater than or equal to A 1 n, A 2 n, A 3 n, A n minus 1 n. If the strict inequalities hold, then A is called a strictly column diagonally dominant matrix. So that means the pivot is greater than or equal to sum of the elements in the particular row. This pivot is greater than or equal to sum of the elements in the particular row. So like that, the nth pivot is greater than or equal to sum of the elements in the particular row. If this happens for all the rows, then you say that the matrix A is strictly column diagonally dominant. Similarly, a row diagonally dominant can be defined in the similar way. A column diagonally dominant matrix possess the attractive property that no interchanges are necessary at any step during the triangulation process using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. That is the advantage we do get it. The pivot element is already there in the right place. So that means you do not need to do it because the pivot which you are talking it is already sitting in the first row first element, second row second element, third row third element like that all minor principal diagonal elements. So the growth factor and the stability of Gaussian elimination for diagonally dominant systems, what would happen to the growth factor for diagonally dominant systems? For a column diagonally dominant matrix, for a column diagonally dominant matrix, Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is identical to Gaussian elimination without pivoting. For a column diagonally dominant matrix, Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is identical to Gaussian elimination without pivoting. Because it is already principal diagonal element is already existing, so therefore no need of pivoting. Then what happens to the growth factor? The growth factor rho for a column diagonally dominant matrix is bounded by 2. That is rho is less than or equal to 2. Thus, for column diagonally dominant systems, Gaussian elimination without pivoting Gaussian elimination without pivoting is perfectly a stable algorithm. For row diagonally dominant matrices, the multipliers can be large. However, row is less than or equal to 2 and thus Gaussian elimination without pivoting is 
still a stable algorithm. We can see from this following examples. Let's say that I have a matrix 5 minus 8, 1, 0. So it is a 2 by 2 matrix. Then what is A of 1? So that is 5 minus 5, 0. So that is R2 minus 1 by 5 R1 which is 0, 10 minus 1 by 5 minus 8. So which is 10, my, 10 plus 8 upon 5. So that is 58 by 5. Okay. So what is the growth factor? Growth factor rho is maximum of 10. The maximum element absolute value is 10. And here 58 by 5 divided by 10. So 58 by 5 divided by 10. So that is 58 by 50. So which is 1.16. So let us see now the diagonal dominant systems. We have seen. Now we would see a specialized system called tridiagonal systems. The LU factorization of a matrix T when it exists may yield L and U having very special simple structures. Both diagonal L having ones on the main diagonal and the super diagonal entities of U are the same that of T specially we can write like this. So this is the main diagonal. This is the one sub diagonal, this is another sub diagonal. So that means 1, 1, 1, 1, L2 like this, like this, you have it. Similarly, you have like this, you have like this, 0, 0. So this is the form of L, this is the form of U. By equating the corresponding elements of the matrices on both sides, the entries Li and Uj can be written as like this. A1 is equal to U1, Ci is equal to Li Ui minus 1, A is equal to Ui plus Li into Bi minus 1. Now, let us see this algorithm. Computing LU factorization of a tridiagonal matrix. The input is the tridiagonal matrix T as given above. The output is the unit lower bidiagonal matrix L and the upper bidiagonal matrix U. That means you will have only main diagonal, either subdiagonal, rest are zeros, or you will have a main diagonal, zeros, and this is the one diagonal, and rest are zeros. That is what is called bidiagonal. So, in that case, the algorithm goes like this. You set u is equal to a1. For i is equal to 1, 2 and do. Li is equal to ci upon ui minus 1. And ui is equal to ai minus li bi minus 1. And end the loop. So, that is how you do write this algorithm. Let us demonstrate to this example. I want to triangularize this matrix. A is equal to 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.5. Using the formula A is equal to LU and Gaussian elimination. Now I would form A is equal to LU where U1 is equal to this element. So anyway this element is bigger than those elements. And this element is anyway bigger than those elements. So this is satisfied. For i is equal to 2, let us apply the, the algorithm which we spoke over here, this algorithm for the matrix, this matrix. L2 is equal to C2 upon U1. So this is the computation which we did it. U2 is equal to A2 minus L2 B1. So, this is the computation you do get.
for i is equal to 3 and l3 so this is the computation you do get and for u3 you do get the computation like this 0.4757 thus we can write this matrix l as so this is the one these are all non zeros and these are all zeros the matrix u is this is the matrix these are all zeros these are all non zeros so using gaussian elimination with partial pivoting step 1 so this is a multiplier this is what you get it and for a1 is equal to this one you get it so this is this is zero so in the step 2 multiplier m2 m3 2 is equal to this thing minus of point 0.243 and a2 matrix you do get like this so this is the matrix and this is the matrix this is zero these are all zeros and capital l is this is the one m21 minus m32 and you do get like this zeros these are all non zero entries so now let us see how actually this block diagonal systems another kind of systems we have seen bidiagonal systems we have seen tridiagonal systems and we will see block diagonal systems we consider this solving the block triadiagonal system tx is equal to b where t is a block triadiagonal matrix and b is equal to b1 b2 b3 bn transpose is a block vector the number of components of the block vector b i is the same as the dimension of the ith block diagonal matrix t so you will have t of x is equal to b where t is block tridiagonal matrix so b is equal to b1 b2 bn transpose so block lu factorization the factorization procedure given in the beginning of this section may be easily extended to the case of the block triadiagonal matrix let us take this matrix T. So, A1 is the one block, A2 is the another block, so like that you will have A n. C2 is the one other block, so this is the another block. B1 is the another block, B2 is the another block, like this, this is the another block. So, this is 0 and this is 0. So, this will become I, 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 this is L2, etc., Ln. These are all zeros, and my u is these things b1, b2, etc. blocks. These are all zeros. So, this is what you get as L into u. Lower triangular matrix and u is the upper triangular matrix. Lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix then the matrices li and ui can be computed as in the case of a scalar triadiagonal matrix as shown in the algorithm block lu factorization of a block triadiagonal matrix what is the input the block triadiagonal matrix t as given below the output is the block unit lower bidiagonal matrix L and the block upper bidiagonal triangular matrix U. So they are all in the step 1 set U1 is equal to A1, 
step 2 for i is equal to 2 3 etc n do the following l i u i minus 1 is equal to c i and u i is equal to a i minus l i into b i minus 1 and end solution of block systems once we have the above factorization we can find the solution x of the block triangle matrix as tx is equal to b by solving ly is equal to b and ux is equal to y successively the solution or ly is equal to b can be achieved by block forward elimination and the solution ux is equal to y can be computed by block substitution. So the way which we did it for the triangle systems, so each block we are doing it over here. So what is the algorithm for block forward elimination? So the input is a block unit lower triangular matrix L, Li and block vector Bi. And what is the output you have? The block solution vector y such that L of y is equal to b. Now set L1 y0 is equal to 0 and for i is equal to 1 to n do yi is equal to bi minus Li into yi minus 1 then end. So then block back substitution is the input is a block upper triangular matrix U and a block vector Y. The output from the above algorithm is the block vector X such that Ux is equal to Y. So U of X is equal to Y. Now set Bn times of n plus 1 is 0 and for i is equal to 1 to n do ui xi is yi minus bi into xi plus 1 and this is how you do get what you call block back substitution. Now let us see with this example how we carried out this two algorithms. Consider the system tx is equal to b where t is of 4 rows and 4 columns. b is of 4 rows, 1 column. Then what is A1? A1 is this is the one block. A2 is this is the another block. And B1 is this one, 1001. Zero, zero, one. And yes, 1001. Zero, zero, one. So what is B1? B1 is this is the one 4, 4 and B2 is 2, comma 2. Now let us look it into the algorithm. If you factorization set u1 is equal to a1 and these are the entries of the matrix. Now for i is equal to 2, let us solve L2 that is u1 L2 where i2 is equal to 1001. So L2 is equal to u1 inverse. So that is how you do get. So that means 1 by ad minus bc minus b minus c da. So you do get this matrix. Compute u2 that is u2 is equal to a2 minus l2 into b1 which implies u of 2 is equal to this matrix 2 by 2 matrix. Block forward elimination is y1 is equal to b1 minus l1 y0 which is equal to b1 so y2 is equal to b2 minus l2 y1 so this is the matrix you do get. Now back substitution if you do that you do get u2 x2 is equal to y2 b2 minus x3 the way which I did so you end up with this matrix. Note that b2 x3 is 0. So if it is 0 then u2 x2 is nothing but y2 so therefore x2 is equal to 1 comma 1. So 
again you write it u1 x1 is equal to y1 minus b1 x2 that is 4 comma 4 4 minus 3 3 4 minus 1 3 so you get x1 is equal to 1 so essentially you get x1 is equal to 1 comma 1 and x2 is equal to 1 comma 1 so that's how we have applied the solution for the the block diagonal systems so today lecture what we have seen is how symmetric matrices would influence the approximate solution of the system x is equal to b how triadiagonal system would help us similarly how bidiagonal system would help us in order to find out the solution to the system ax is equal to b so i will stop over here and thank you very much for listening to the contents of the course today so thanks you once again